to the second night of the Female Coaches Zoom series hosted by Wrestle Like a Girl and D1 Women's Wrestling. Whereas yesterday we talked about, oh, here we go. Let me change the screen. Um, um, there we go. As yesterday we talked about uh, the journey into coaching. Today we'll discuss the art of coaching, honing our, and growing our skills as a coach. What issues do we face? what resources help us develop as a coach, and how do we navigate as women who wear multiple hats, coach, employee, mom, and more. My name is Taylor O'Donnell Bacher, and I lead coaching development with Rest Like a Girl, and I'm excited to learn with you guys tonight. The decision, uh, this, discussion, um, this discussion speaks to the experiences of women in coaching positions. However, we, are wel we welcome all who are interested to learn with us parents, our male coach and mentor allies, athletes who are curious about what their futures might hold, administrators who want to understand and support their female coaches, and anyone else who is passionate about supporting female leadership in our sport. After introducing tonight's panelists, we have a set of prepared questions. We'll save time for your questions to the panelists at the end of the session. Post your questions in the Q&A section. That, that's a little bubble that says Q&A at the bottom or at the top, wherever it is on your screen. And then the chat will be used for us to share links and you may also comment throughout the session. So just if we put all those Q and A's into the Q and A section, it'll be easier to find them later. Um, thank you. And I would like to first introduce Catherine Scheib. She's a seven time national team member for Team USA. Throughout her long career, she was top 10 in the world, a multiple time national medalist, interna international medalist, University World Champion, Dave Schultz International Champion, two-time college national champion, US Open Champion, and was third at the 2012 and 2016 Olympic trials, and second in the mini tournament for the 2021 Olympic team trials. Sorry, yeah. Oh yeah, okay, good, I got it. Okay, Catherine is currently mentoring and coaching athletes all over the country, as well as speaking on her experiences as a professional athlete in the challenging sport of wrestling. She started the athlete, parent, and coach resource, LuchaFit. She aims to help more athletes and coaches grow in the sport of wrestling through her story and leadership. She serves as a board member on USA Wrestling and Titan Mercury Wrestling Club. She's a mother of two and resides in Denver, Colorado. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Laura, yay. Laura Lopez Sapiro um, is competed in wrestling for about 10 years before transitioning to coaching and refereeing. She's yeah. refereed and coached in California, Colorado, Illinois, and the United Kingdom. Laura is a US WOA M1 MAT official and earned her USAW NCEP gold coach certification and UWW referee category three license in November of 2022. She holds a bachelor's degree in secondary education and a master's degree in information and learning technologies. Laura currently lives with her husband and her son in England. He is eight or nine months old right now. Um, welcome, very welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. Um, Aha. Brazil um, has, she's currently, she's coached at Vanguard University. She coaches for Titan Mer Mercury Wrestling Club. And she was a 2022 U15 Pan Am coach and 2023 U17 World Championship coach. She's a two-time national, college national All-American, four-time national finalist and all, or All-American, Cadet World Team member, three-time California State Champion, and she currently resides in Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Brazil. 
Hi, friends. Um, Amanda Henley was a three-time Women's Collegiate Wrestling Association All-American and two-time national finalist for Toronto, winning her national title her senior year in 2015. She helped the Toronto, she helped the Toronto win four tornado. I'm sorry, is that? <laughs> yes, tornado. The King University tornadoes. My bad. Sorry. Ah, that makes much more sense. She helped the tornado win four national titles, two years as um, King won the NCWA National Dual Championships and the WCWA National Championships in 2014 and 2015. She also has competed for Team USA as she is a three-time USA national team member and three-time senior Pan Am um, medalist. In 2016, Hendy won the US Open. Hendy graduated from King in 2015 with a bachelor's degree in arts in business and with an emphasis on sports management and a minor in coaching. Welcome you guys. It is such a pleasure to have you here. We're going to stop share. And um, I'd like to ask you guys a little bit about your story, um, kind of with a special introduction to each one of you. So let's start with Catherine. Catherine, as a lifelong learner, um, as a lifelong student of the sport of wrestling, you have found a way to translate complex topics into tangible information for athletes, coaches, and parents. Um, Lori says this, this, is, a, this is like meta. Uh, can you share a bit of your story and how you became a thought leader in this space? So I, I think that really started kind of emerging for me after I, um, I did what I, what I now I'm calling my soft retirement. Um, so after 2016, uh, wasn't sure exactly what the next step would be. Like most athletes were like, where do I go now? Um, I was third Olympic trials and for, um, for myself and my husband, we were like kids, family, like, where are we? What are we doing? Um, and so for me, it was like, shoulder repair needed to happen. And I knew kids was in the future. So as I moved towards like that kind of new phase of life, um, I knew I wanted to stay in touch with wrestling somehow. And that's where Lucha Fit emerged. And it started as my passion of just writing for athletes and giving, giving perspective on what it's taken to like be in the sport at a high level, how other girls could actually even start to think about like reaching that. Like I was just, I just recognized how there was very little crossover of this information and, and it was hard for us to share in the beginning. Um, and I think that it always was something I was into, into like my sister, Sarah and I were like trying to start a YouTube channel, like way back when we were competing, when it was like kind of lame and people were like, what are you trying to do? Like, why? We were just trying to like disseminate this information, like show what it's like to be a female wrestler. And so that's where Lucha Fit showed up. And then I think what transpired was really incredible because I got bitten by the wrestling bug again, wanted to come back after having my son. And meanwhile, I've already started this like whole new adventure of like sharing information, educating in this new space of Lucha Fit, uh, starting to do events. So they kind of like all merge at the same time. And I got to start truly like testing out some of my theories. So I got to write about things, write about what I was like currently like thinking about when I was training and working through and then start teaching it and then go back to the training room. And actually, so I think it really started becoming this true trial and error um, format for me. And it's kind of continued in that way. And, I, and competing up to, to 2021, was pretty special to be able to continue to do that. And then um, meanwhile, coaching and working with athletes and writing and figuring out ways to, to challenge myself and create new ways to think about wrestling so that girls can be like, I am at a high level. Like wrestling isn't just something I can dabble in. I can really like be intentional about my training and I have somebody who's giving me some information on it, so. So like being, having that forward thinking into like, let's use technology to communicate what wrestling's like to a wider audience. That was like, you were early in that, right? And, and um, how, how do you think your, the beginning of your life has impacted how you can be such a forward thinker and how you can say, start looking to what's next? 
yeah, growing up in a family where we were advocating for wrestling uh, was pretty impactful. Even though at the time I was like, stop talking about wrestling, everybody, because my family was so involved in like helping support the political side of girls wrestling in California. Um, and clearly my mom and sister, everyone's still involved. Um, so there's been moments of like, it's too much. But I think that that was like such a heavy influence on me. I think we were, um, it just became really natural to to fall into that role of of supporting. So that's, I think, where my mind went automatically. Thank you for that fantastic answer. Um, I'm going to move to Brazil. I have a question for you. Um, Brazil, you have been described as a hustler for learning and developing as a coach. Um, what would you, um, would you explain how your journey from athlete to coach has shaped this par powerful characteristic within you? Um, whoever said that is a liar. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was Emma. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's been awesome. Um, I think that I've just had such amazing role models in my life. I've been super, super privileged to just have, and even, so, I mean, well, I've been in the sport for 27 years now. And so like, even back then in California, when it wasn't, you know, as popping as, as it is now, right. And, or, you know, women weren't as, um, dedicated to the craft that they are now, but like I had such positive male role models in my life too, right. Where a lot of women have opposite, you know, um, and I've had, I've dabbled in that opposite as well. Um, but I think just having such amazing, amazing influences in my life have immediately like just kind of boosted me towards this, this career and this profession. Um, and that kind of made that transition pretty easy just because of, of the great people in my life. And I'm pretty selective on, on kind of who I keep in my life now, especially the older I get, I, you know, I just try to keep my circle a little bit smaller. Um, the people that mean a lot to take care of those that take care of you kind of deal. And, um, you know, and that really just kind of help shape me and, and, and kind of who the coach I'm becoming today, you know, so it's, it's been awesome. Can you describe a couple of things that you do that gives you that, um, like hustler for learning and developing as a, <laughs> as, as a coach? What is that? What is that? What do you think? Yeah. Um, I mean, um, that? the last like couple of years, um, I started coaching in 2015, 2016 when I stopped competing. Um, but I really just became like a yes person. Um, just saying yes to a lot, a lot of things. Um, hey, can you come to this clinic? Hey, can you come help me coach this? Hey, can you, you know, run this private? Hey, can you go host this event? Hey, can, and I'm just like, yes, 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 yes. And just kind of submerging myself in as many things as possible with, um, you know, some amazing people um, that kind of, you know, created that like hustler mentality of just like, hey, no matter what I'm gonna do, I'll be there, you know, I'll put it in my calendar, I'll get there and I'll help you out, you know, we'll do it together. Um, Emma and I do a lot of things together as well. And that's always fun. Um, you know, I'll fly out, go see her. We'll, you know, run a camp or clinic together, or, you know, things like that. It's just, so yeah, just be, becoming a yes person, which I will say um, over the last like year and a half has almost become too much. And I was like, hey, I need to uphold boundaries now because because as I'm shaping myself now and become this coach and and now people are like, okay, Brazil will say yes, no problem. Just put her in, put her in. And so now I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like now I need to, because- in order for me to continuously pour into these athletes and to continuously pour into the people or the sport and those around me, I have to put into myself and I'm getting to a point now too, where I'm having to like learn boundaries, which I know we'll talk about later on. Um, but that's also a new territory for me as a young woman, um, learning, learning those things. And that's been, that's been a fun journey within myself as well too. So it's been cool, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of, a, you know, long answer short of just being a yes person and hustling and just submerging myself um, with all these amazing women um, and men um, within our wrestling community and just kind of doing it. I really appreciate that. And that balance between like jumping in and engaging and just, you know, doing it versus finding that boundaries. I'm excited to explore that more as we yeah, uh, continue. Even, even when, you know, things were uncomfortable, like even, I mean, there's, you know, times are like, oh, am I ready to do that? Am I good enough to do this role? Am I smart enough? Am I this, this, you know, and just like, you know what? Yeah, why not? You know, and learning, learning along the way. So it's been awesome. I love that. Thank you so much, Brazil. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Laura, next question is for you. Um, I understand that you're passionate about using tech to make the lives of coaches easier. 
Yes, please. I wrote that. That's silly. <laughs> Can you share a bit of your story and how you're um, innovating as a coach? Yeah. Uh, so I competed for 10 years um, and then I got, like started, you know, teaching full time has done competing. So started teaching full time and I really there's it was like two completely different sides. I was coaching on one side and then teaching and doing that stuff on the other. So I um, I got really good with ed technology, just loving it, learning it. I had some really great models in uh, in Alaska, actually, in Tanunik, Alaska. I, I got some really amazing education and training in how to utilize ed tech to just more, more than anything to help my students see the world and access the world and what's, you know, outside of, of the village that they maybe had never left yet, you know? So um, we even had one clinic I had a wrestling club started there where we were able to have um coach Steiner come in and visit and like share some tips and Randy Miller was in and so they got to have that I brought the world to them through technology and then as I evolved through um my teaching tool I saw this this gap uh, in wrestling where wait a second we have all of these as a you know I was teaching at whatever schools I was coaching at and I saw this gap of learning that could be filled with not only educational like pedagogy, but educational technology. So being able to use these free tools that the schools have like subscriptions to and apply them to my wrestling room just it opened up this world because I'm seeing these light bulbs go off in my classroom as I use these educational technologies and teaching pedagogies. And I started doing that in the wrestling room too. And those same light bulbs were going off, you know, like letting, kids explore okay so you're trying to get half in and but if they post their arm out here like how can you and they're blocking it like let's let's problem solve that like how would you do that or you know posting in a google classroom like all right this was you know we're going into the second period and this is the situation you're up by this or you're down by this and like what do you what do you choose top bottom neutral defer and then explain why and then there's a group discussion about why you know what i mean so it's it just exploded and i I've been geeking out about it ever since. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's me. So I've, I I use it in rest and refereeing now. And I uh, like here here in England, I help with British Wrestling Association a lot. So we do we do like monthly meetups, and we'll do um, Kahoot quiz games on um, like uh, rule changes and things like that. So I just, I still still use it and utilize it. It's great seeing other people evolve and copying and pasting some of their ideas too. It's so much fun. <laughs> That's very cool. I just love the the way you bring coaching and teaching and um, and technology all together because those are powerful, powerful um, pieces on their own and together. I mean, it only multiplies that exponentially. Thank you so much. Okay, last question is for Amanda. Um, Amanda, you have experienced wrestling through many different lenses, and I'm told you're one of one of your greatest strengths is how you are able to relate to athletes. Can you share a bit of your story and how you've translated your experiences as an athlete into coaching? Yeah, so um, I'm I actually am still like competing and on the competitive circuit, which has been its own like crazy ride and challenge, but I, I do also feel like I have a foot in both worlds right now. So I think that's probably obviously something that helps me relate to the athletes a lot. And um, even just through my own wrestling journey, journey, I've been, I mean, to this day, even outside of wrestling, just really into the, like uh, personal development and constantly improving myself, my systems, like, um, kind of like self-management almost so um I have I've developed like all these things for myself that I like to share with my athletes um and help them develop and I think my coaching style is um almost like leading the athletes to answer their own questions a little bit like encouraging them to like discover themselves more than me like trying to make them fit a certain mold it's just helping them and understanding that every athlete's different and helping them discover themselves and what works for them and what doesn't. That's, I love that very much. Um, what are some lessons that you, um, 
like, how do you make that work with be with competing and with coaching? It's unique. Yeah, it's honestly been extremely difficult. And I think in, in the same way, like Brazil talking about learning boundaries for me, it's been a struggle of, um, not just boundaries, but also like prioritization. Like it's very difficult. I feel I have to be extremely intentional about like things for myself because that tends to take the back burner. Coaching just like fills up so much of your time and energy that I have to be very intentional about um, really scheduling. So that's where like a lot of the like management stuff comes in where I have to be very intentional about on paper managing like my time and um, constantly checking in and making sure that the way I'm spending my time and energy is aligned with my priorities and making sure that I'm um, getting what I need as well as helping my athletes to the best of my ability as well. That's awesome. Thank you so hey, much. Fun, so much. Fun fact, fun fact about uh, Hendy and I, we actually wrestled each other when we were like five, six years old in California as like one of like the young girls, you know, back in the day. And then in, again in high school and then like we ended up being college roommates in college and then, you know, alongside each other at the coaching circuit. And then I was able to corner her at the U.S. Open, you know, two couple weeks ago. It's been super fun being alongside this woman for the last 20 something plus years. It's been cool. The way back. Cool thing about <laughs> women's wrestling. Yeah. Since we're like 100%. four or five years old. I mean, that's the thing, like, uh, when I'm loving wrestling and not sure about it, the people that, and the relationships that we build through wrestling, so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You muted yourself, Kayla. There we go. Um, uh, so the next question we're going to have is going to be directed for um, both Brazil and for Laura. Um, what are some resources that you found helpful to elevate your coaching? How do you stay on top of finding um, and storing new resources like logs and sites and portals um, that you consistently check and resources like lists that you store? And how do you organize these folders electronically or do you do it old school or is it, what does that look like to you? How do you stay organized and how do you find these resources that help you develop? Well, my answer is probably not as tech savvy as Laura's, but um, I just, I mean, honestly, if I'm out and about and I come across a resource or a person that is resourceful to me, I just throw it in the notes in my phone and I create like certain um, folders within the notes in my phone. And then when I get back home, I have Excel sheets for everything. And that's kind of like simply what I do there. Um, I have like a, you know, folder in my phone of like books that I need to read, um, areas that I need to target, you know, focus areas. And then, um, or athletes that I need to catch up with and mentor or where I'm at in the process, mentoring process with certain of those athletes um, or articles and stuff like that. And then I'll go back and I refer to like my Excel sheets back on my computer back home. Um, but I also attend like ref clinics or like coaching clinics and things like that that are always just helpful resources. But to me, it's also just like my environment. Um, the biggest resource is my environment and the people that I'm surrounded with, so. I love it. That makes so much sense. And you say you're not very techie, but that sounds like a very tangible way to utilize resources. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easy. I mean, when we're always on the go, like as wrestling coaches, we're always everywhere on the go all the time. Like, you know, so it's like the one thing you're going to have is your phone, right? So hundred percent. Okay. Laura, what's what, how, how do you um, tackle this? So I'm going to add on to that because 90% of the time when I like run into a coach or a referee or someone doing something like great, and I'm like, tell me more right now so I can absorb it. It's 90% of me is just taking note. Like I'm texting myself a note or a link or mm -hmm. something. And then later when I get home, whether I'm traveling or not, or when I'm near like Wi-Fi, then I, then I start organizing things. Okay. So this is definitely, I can use this, this tech tool or this idea or this strategy in this in this wrestling group that I'm working with for British wrestling, but I could also apply it to this like NSEP program that I'm working on too. And so like it gets copied and pasted and I'm a Google nerd, like I'm Google everything. So like it, it might, that same resource might be in like four different places in my Google folders um, for, because it's, you know, wherever it is. So it definitely, I just texting things to myself as I'm having these conversations helps a lot and going from there. Um, but I've actually found, so at any 
any um, coaching course or even education stuff that I can get access to, like, obviously that works, but podcasts, man, like podcasts are my daily go-to thing. And I subscribe to some ones that I, some of them I'm, I was just mind blown. Like if, if anyone's ever heard of Adam Grant, the book Think Again by Adam Grant. Yeah, I just read book. that, Laura. Literally just read that. It is like, I feel like every coach and teacher in the world should read Think Again by Adam Grant. He also has a podcast, Work Life by Adam Grant. Um, and then there's another book, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, I think Mike Clayton's on here. He's the one who suggested that I read that. And that those two books, they're just life cha life changing. I mean, in general. Um, so once I find an author that really hits, like really hits home and everything, um, if they have a podcast, I'll start subscribing to that, listening to that. Um, another one is uh, the Fierce Athlete podcast. It's religious based, but so female empowering. And it's more, they focus so much on, it's like what we preach, right? It's not about, it's not just about wins, losses. It's about you as a person and your character through this, you know, through your sport, you know, how you help your community as an athlete, things like that. So it's, that's podcast is my thing. Like I don't, I don't really read studies. If a podcast mentions a study or research that's done, then I might go Google it and get, you know, read the white papers and things like that. But man, like podcast is where it's at for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. That's awesome. So what sort of, um, development have you gotten through like the traditional met methods of um uh like ed educating yourself and what are the ones that really what are the lessons or the pieces that really stick out for you like if somebody was just going to get started where would you send them I would send them if they were able to so definitely I will preach this all day long the NSET program with USA Wrestling more than more than anything because i mean it's great lessons that you learn but the people you get to meet and learn from and like if you're if you're lucky enough to be able to be to go to like um like a team camp or a coaches college or something like not only in that main content that's presented to you do you get to learn from but the the, the side conversations and the problem solving and the that's what really matters. If you put yourself, like Brazil said, if you put yourself in an environment where people are creating and talking and innovating, like, like, man, you can pick up so many good ideas and things to apply. Like someone, uh, I don't remember the name right now, but they're using, uh, for their high school team, they're using Google Classroom, like a course that they've created in order for their athletes to apply to be captains of the team. Like they don't have to be on varsity. They don't have to be seniors. They have to go through courses within a Google Classroom in order to qualify to become a captain. You know what I mean? So little leadership lessons, nuggets learned, things like that. But And I wouldn't have known that if I had not been in that environment where we were talking about elevating athletes to, to leadership roles, you know? So like Brazil said, being willing to say yes to like, you know, I don't, ugh, this I might not be like, it might be imposter syndrome. Like, I don't think I should be here around all these, like these names and these people, but man, put yourself in there, ask questions, be curious, be curious and ask lots of clarifying questions and the world opens up for you, man. It's, it's a beautiful thing. There's some really great comments coming in through the chat too, about other people who use that and other people who are stoked to start using that. Um, how about you, Brazil? Looks like you have a little bit of a button problem happening. Okay, we'll come back to that. If you, uh, when you get that figured out and you wanna hop back in, just uh, speak up. Um, does anybody else have any other um, coaching resources development that they really want to plug? Okie doke, we'll move to our next question. Um, this one is for Catherine and Amanda. 
Who are some of your mentors and how have they helped you develop? Do you wanna go ahead, Catherine? Sure, I can start. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think when it comes to, I'm gonna go back to like the the nice little like intro thing that you guys have for me. And um, I think when it when it comes to thinking like helping this sport go like above and beyond, right? Like in so many ways, I think about how women's wrestling we have to do like a lot of this quote catch up, right? Like we have a lot of expectations of us to like be at the same level as the men or the boys and all these different things. And same thing with our coaches, our athletes, our leaders, everybody. But it's like time is technically like not on our side, you know, like we'll never make up the time. So, but what we can make up is like with our, with our ability to kind of like, with our intellect, with our ability to kind of like transcend that and just say like, it doesn't even matter. So I, so I actually think that as a group, like collectively, we have to kind of like move up above, right? And not play catch up. And so in that way, I'm constantly looking to a lot of people and information outside of wrestling because I wanna bring that into wrestling so that we are, we are thought leaders of sport in general and we're thought leaders of like women in sport. So those kinds of things really motivate me. So I find, I truly find inspiration in like, everybody and anything at all times and I've at least practiced enough with it that I can have discernment so I'm not like too bombarded by information like let me just take it all in I've been there where I've like taken it all in from everybody but now I'm in a place where I am um, I can listen to a, a lot of information you know Laura's talking about podcasts and like who is it who is it in the podcast world getting so much incredible information but then um just hear the pieces that I need that I'm like ah that's what I need to like help elevate my athletes this is what I want um women within wrestling to start like learning how to like coach especially because I know the conversation a lot is around imposter syndrome and why are we like feeling this way and um you know there's there's even like a question already in here kind of about like getting back into the room so it's like I have a lot of passion about girls getting back into the room so like using people around us to see like how are they how are they working mentally working past those hurdles so that we're just like we're just soaring you know um and but besides besides using the influences all around me um I definitely have I want to all like I kind of want to give like a little shout out list here because I have some people who've really been helpful and influential in helping my path and they're people that I just keep coming back to um I think the, the first one early on, um, obviously it's like whoever's closest to you. So like your partner, for me, my husband, I constantly am bringing information. Hey, I, what about this? Like, I, want, I need some thought, um, support through this concept I have. Like I'm thinking through this, help me like reword this, help me think through it. Does it work for wrestling? Does it work for wrestling coaches? Whatever. Right. So he's someone I always go to, to kind of synthesize the information that I've just gathered, you know, like I'm trying to process it. Um, early on, Randy Ramirez, who uh, started Hook Sweep, he was a really awesome business supporter and coach and helped me like direct, direct um, my thoughts and ideas, like thinking of business within wrestling different than I could have ever thought of, which was really helpful um, and not getting stuck in like the perceptions like wrestling, you can't because it's wrestling, you can't, you know, like we're moving past that. Um, and, um, and he's been pretty instrumental in, in helping David Taylor start like M2 and a lot of his, his works and all, all his business stuff. So that's exciting to see, you know, within wrestling and business. Um, I think some of my other mentors, Andrew Yamamoto has been a big mentor, someone that I really like go to for a lot of information and uh, like help me work through this. What do you think about this idea? Um, my mom, Joan Fulp, is incredible because I can say, hey, what's going on in your world? And here, like, here's what's going on, what I think could be going on. So we like pass that information back and forth. Um, on this call, Emma and Jackie, I mean, I think, I think it's incredible that we have this peer group that we can just start talking together and learning about the little, oh, stop it. Um, learning about the little things that we're all doing like in our separate worlds. And I've learned so much from Emma and Jackie about I mean, just, just the passion around wrestling 
and the passion around like helping these young athletes get to the next level, like the information they have, I mean, it's, it's incredible. So the, the list definitely goes on and on, but I think you start finding like your peer group has way more mentors than you realize. And, um, and their influences are extremely powerful. Thank you so much. That that was a very good answer. And we have some, uh, yeah, it's, it, I think it really hits home for a lot of us with all the wisdom you just dropped. Um, uh, and Amanda, um, what are some of your mentors and how have they helped you develop? Um, I, I feel really similar to Catherine where I draw it from a lot of places. And I think um, even like Laura, like using her, her teaching experiences and applying that to wrestling, it's kind of like the same thing. And I think we all kind of do that. Um, I've had some people that have helped me specifically my, my coach this year, who was also my college coach. And now I'm working as his assistant um, has been more of like a hands-on uh, mentor where even last year, like I just would ask a lot of questions, like how would you handle this? Where it was like a lot more like wrestling specific. Um, but I feel like I've learned stuff from like anyone who's ever coached me, whether it was what was working or what wasn't working, um, resources. Uh, I use Google a lot to communicate with my team. Like Google calendar is like a lifesaver for me. I use Google survey to like communicate with them because there's so many of them. So it's just a place for me to get like feedback from them. Um, and that stuff I've learned from other coaches. So I feel like just like wrestling where a lot of us, like you pick up a move here, you pick up a move there and like, it just kind of creates your wrestling style. I feel the same way about coaching where I just pick different things up from different people. Um, I've learned a lot from, I have a, an uncle who's like about my age and he played football and I've learned a lot about like athletics through him, like, and just like footwork and, and explosivity where I do like Catherine's idea of like learning from other sports too. I feel like there's so much um, to be gained from other sports. And for me, I've been like wrestling specific for most of my life. The only other sport I really was into was gymnastics. So um, for me being so sucked into this world, it's really refreshing sometimes to get other coaching and athletic perspectives from other sports. Um, I've also been in like um, last year at Colorado Mesa, I was in a really awesome thing that the lacrosse coach put together there where we, the female coaches would meet once a month and we would talk about like pretty much anything. And, and sometimes we would be like, okay, next week we're going to talk about this or next month we're going to talk about this. And um, so learning a lot from those type of coaches. And I loved even just the idea of the female coaches meeting once a month. Um, and then this year at King, I've been in a class that meets once a week. That's like a leadership class. And I also had like my coaching minor there. So I've just learned a lot through like classes and, um, you know, some of it's textbook, but a lot of it's like those teachers and professors that are leading those classes and um, just learning about all the different aspects of coaching from those different people as well. Ah, that makes so much sense. And something that both the, both you and Catherine bring out is that it's not just from in the, within the sport of wrestling, it's from out, outside of the sport of wrestling and that the relationship between mentors and community is really big. And it's interesting that, you know, you're, you, you know, you know, as you guys are developing, it's not just one mentor, it's many different mentors from this part of my life, from this part of my life, this person is my, my, who I work through and communicate with to help me understand what I'm thinking about this or where this person um, does that in this other area. Mm -hmm. I find that very interesting. Um, thank you. Okay, All right, we're gonna move on to our next question, which will be for Amanda and Laura. Um, what are your two or three key ingredients to your in your personal coaching philosophy? Um, so I would say, a a big one for me is like, I, I have to meet my athletes where they are. Um, and that involves asking ahead of time, like my, the big, and I will admit again, like, cause ego is the enemy. So let's put ego aside. Right. And I have to admit, I made mistakes at the beginning of my coaching career, assuming that every athlete that stepped into our practice room was like gung ho wanting to be a state 
competitor and like go to the Olympics and wrestling was going to be their life. Some kids just wanted a safe place to be, you know, at, after the school day and that, that they wanted that to be the wrestling room and that, you know what I mean? So I, I had to really refocus after the first couple of years and start being curious and asking questions ahead of time. Like, Hey, what do you want to get out of this season? Like, do you just, I started asking straight up, do you want a safe place to be? Or do you, do you want to just try something new? Uh, or do you like have goals of wanting to be a world champion at the age of 16? Let me know. So I can differentiate, you know, how, how I coach you, you know, during the day and things like that, because like, just like I might have to differentiate within the classroom, cause I'm not going to teach a kid who doesn't understand like linear algebra. I'm not going to all of a sudden throw like calculus at them. If, if, if I have an athlete that doesn't necessarily understand the basics of a double leg takedown, I'm not going to throw in a whole bunch of other like landing and just throw legs in there in the middle of the takedown situation. So I, you know, I ask a lot of questions to see where they are and what their goals are. Um, so yeah, big piece for me is meeting the athlete where they are and understanding what they want out of it. Um, and just starting with, I'm just grateful that you're walking onto the wrestling mat and, and trying out the sport and being a part of this community, you know, because with, with some kids that I had, I've had some kids in the room that they didn't even, they did not want to compete. They had no interest in competing. At the, and the positive impact they had in the room without even competing, it was worth all of it. Like it was so worth it. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's one big ingredient. Um, another one is that I've noticed, and this is a lit little heavier topic maybe, but like I, I have very honest conversations with parents about like we, you know, you might be gung-ho about wrestling, but like maybe maybe your kid, this wants to just be a fun sport for them. You know what I mean? So how can we meet in the middle? Or I know you have really high expectations and goals and stuff for your, but like, you know, how can we make sure ev everyone is happy in this environment and on this team and feel safe and loved no matter what the win loss record is at the end of the season. So how can we best support your child as a person through the season and not necessarily as only an athlete? through the season. So having very open, honest communication with parents um, as we go. And I, that has gone well sometimes, other times not, but it leads to, I found more retention sometimes when, when we have that relationship with the parents built up ahead of time and that open communication ahead of time. This is a really interesting topic that actually came <laughs> up last uh, night when we were speaking about this is, you know, like, not every athlete is coming into the room to be a world champion, right? And um, of course that's, you know, you know, if we think about it, we, you know, that makes sense, right? Um, how, how, how do you balance the need to be competitive and the need to support your athletes um, where they're at uh, in a way that, you know, keeps the energy in your room in a positive um, and, and maybe successful space or not? What does that look like to you? So when, so when I, so when I ask ahead of time, right, when I know ahead of time and, you know, you check throughout the season. So where I do you still just want to be a practice athlete or you think you're ready to compete or, Hey, I know you were gung ho for competing at the beginning of the season. You know, I've, I've noticed though, you're not as fired up now. Talk to me about that. Where's that, you know, where are you at now kind of thing. Um, when you have those ongoing conversations, throughout the season, you adjust based on that. You know what I mean? And so maybe, maybe there might be like at one school I was at, there was two activity buses after school that would take kids home, you know, on the bus routes after practices. And so kids could leave at, uh, at 5 p.m. for the first bus route or, you know, bus home, or they could leave later at 6.30 for the later bus route. And there was always no judgment either way. You know what I mean? for athletes, if you're like done, if you're like done for that day and you just can't, like you are checked out mentally, that's okay. Like head home, that's fine, no big deal. Um, but, and then if those athletes, if they wanted to go that extra mile, if they were getting ready for, um, maybe they did have goals of wanting to be a captain at some point in time, or they wanted to, you know, take leadership roles and go further, like, hey, then maybe we stay, we stay later 
and we work on some specific like one-on-one -on -one skills with you and a partner. Maybe you stay later and you help, you know, coach the little kids program who comes in later. So we, we work on those opportunities where this is the baseline for practice, right? That everyone who's participating, whether you're competing or not, you come in and you support the team by being a great practice partner and you're trying, you're putting effort in and positivity. Um, and then if you want to stretch, you can stay for a, like a little later of a practice um, and stretch your skills. And you can even get further and start teaching the little kids because the empowerment of teaching, oh, giving kids like, hey, you've got skills here, teach these younger ones and uh, blossoming. If I, I wish that I would have started coaching and learning the rules earlier on as an athlete. And I think I would have been a more successful athlete just in general. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, now throwing it to you, Amanda, um, what is, um, is your personal co coaching philosophy? I think some of it is like, you know, probably most in, involved in most people's coaching philosophy. Um, I think a big part of it for me is like mentorship where I am getting to know athletes on an individual level. And I think especially at the, at the college level, um, I, I, and I know this, like as an athlete and as a coach, like as you get older, like wrestling becomes so much more than just wrestling and like stuff outside of wrestling is impacting your wrestling so much. So I find that a lot of the work that I'm putting in with athletes is helping them figure life stuff out so that they can focus on wrestling or, you know what I'm saying? So it's a lot of like mentorship in that way. And I feel um, wrestling for me is, it has become like a very like philosophical thing as I've gotten older. And I feel like understanding wrestling helps me understand life and vice versa. And I, I try to help the kids understand that stuff too. And um, just kind of make connections between that kind of stuff. So I, I feel like my wrestling philosophy is very philosophical itself. <laughs> um, and I, I like developing their character. I feel like if um, I'm helping them be like the best people that they can be, like it's going to allow them to be the best athletes that they can be. Um, man managing their lives outside of it, as well as in the wrestling room. Um, and then another big thing for me that might be um, you know, not one of the status quo values is curiosity is very important to me in the room. I try to lead them to ask questions or, or maintain like a level of curiosity for me as a coach, like just constantly trying to get better. And then, um, I feel like that keeps that element of fun. Like that's super important to me. Like, I think one of the most important things in anything you're doing is enjoying what you're doing. So, I do think that making it more like a puzzle to be solved um, rather than like uh, some like hard obstacle to overcome is a, a funner approach. And I think it's better for like longevity and just like enjoyment of what you're doing is just maintaining like curiosity. I love that answer and um, how you talk about that. I am. Um... You, you speak a lot about like a holistic approach to coaching athletes and, and coaching, you know, the, an athlete, but also the whole person. Um, can you reflect a little bit about your experiences being coached um, and when and how you've responded to somebody coaching you like focused on only wrestling versus coaching you on that holistic approach and why your coaching ph like philosophy is more towards that holistic approach rather than that like like athletics focused winning approach. Yeah. Um, I've actually never thought about that. So it's interesting, but I know the answer. Um, it, I don't think I did get that. And I think that's what I needed. Um, I have had a, a lot of struggles like outside of wrestling that definitely like impacted my wrestling. Um, I did have, it's, I had people reach out to me and stuff, but I don't think I ever had someone, uh, like hold my hand and help me through some of those things the way I do for my athletes. And, I, I think I do that for them because I know that that's what I needed. And so I try to be that person for them. Ah, oh, I love it. Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we'll move on to our next question. Um, this one will be for Catherine and Brazil. How does your coaching style and your philosophy shift as you coach various age levels of, um, and then genders, 
and performance levers, levels of athletes. Yeah, do you want me to go first, Kat? Yeah, okay. Um, I think a few things change, not, not too much um, has to change, but there are a few things that do change. So like in my, like in my coaching philosophy, uh, it's consistency, right? Consistency um, kind of trumps everything. So if you're consistent in your eating habits, your sleeping habits, your training habits, um, you know, things that you're doing outside the wrestling room, everything, everything will fall into place when it's supposed to fall into place. Right. Um, and I don't think that that should change whether you're seven years old learning how to wrestle or, you know, um, at the senior level. Um, now, do certain things, you know, need to adjust? Yeah. I think that like right now, currently, like I, I do coach almost at, at every level. I coach the youth kids um, and then I coach a high school team and then I coach a college team and then I coach a time at the senior level. So I'm literally every day I'm having to adjust, you know, from six to seven a.m. I'm with the university you know, three to five, I'm with um, high school, from five to six, I'm with youth. And then from six to eight, you know, I'm with like, you know, um, elite level athletes. So it's like, everything has kind of changed throughout my day. Um, and some and then and then I'm with boys and girls. And so um, with boys, it's definitely uh, different, right? They're a little bit more uh, transactional, you know, it's a little bit more transactional based versus women who are a little bit more um, emotionally driven and you as a coach kind of have to adapt to that and, and that's okay right um, the way that I speak to a dude um, and the ways that we're coaching um, can adapt um, and then same thing on the performance level you know when I'm coaching somebody at the senior level versus you know a youth kid right at the 30 second break you know am I giving super detailed instructions on like hey they're leaning hard with their left leg x y and z here this and this and this no sometimes you know when I'm coaching a youth kid, it's okay thinking about like hey let's control our breathing you know, maybe give them a morale boost and things like that, right? Um, versus uh, some of the things that we do um, with, you know, at a, at a higher level. So, um, and then obviously, you know, verbiage can change, tone changes and stuff. So, but I think overall, I try to stay um, pretty consistent myself within my coaching philosophy, which is uh, consistency, you know, amongst everything. So uh, those are some, some little ways that kind of I have to adapt throughout my day, um, every day. <laughs> Yeah, I really appreciate learning about that. That's super interesting about like how you coach on that side versus, you know, and then what about your like uh, energy level? Like, what do you come, like, what is your, what kind of, what's, yeah. I haven't seen you coach a lot. What is Brazil <laughs> yeah. in, in the coaching room? Oh, it's fun. It's fun and it's energetic and it's a good time and we're there to just kind of just, um, I'm like everybody's personal hype woman. <laughs> um, but in the corner, I think that um, I, I have to adjust to each athlete, right? Because there's certain athletes that need a calmer presence in the corner and you have to know that about your person, right? And then there's other athletes that I'm, I can like, you know, say a few key words and, you know, give them a good smack and they're good to go. And you just kind of have to know, know that person. Um, and that's, that's your job as a coach, but in the practice room, I try to keep things super, super light, you know, um, energetic, um, and just fun and super detail oriented. I say there's, there's three things on three different ends. I always say, you know, uh, details, angles, and inches. If you work on those three things within every position or every move or, you know, every scenario, you're going to get better. And then I tell the athletes every time and say, if you believe in three things and you'll be good, it's believe in yourself, believe in your training, believe in your coaches. And if you believe in those three things then you're going to be all right. Oh, I love that. And that energy you bring to each of those practice rooms is that same like energy, that fun, keep it light, have fun, and then keep it detail oriented. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It is hard. It is hard sometimes because I start my mornings so early. You know, if I have practice at 6am, I live in East LA and I have to get to Orange County, Costa Mesa, you know, for 530am kind of practice. I got to leave my house by 450 in the morning. I get over there to practice, run practice, still have to have a lot of energy, teach the technique, be detailed, and then right, and I'm coaching different levels. So during my college season, we're in a different peak area. So I have to, you know, manage my, okay, hey, we're being detailed, focus on this areas. And then I got to head over to the high school, you know, at some point, and then, um, you know, they're in a different part of their season. So I still have to bring high energy, but maybe we're in a different part of, of where we're supposed to be at, you know? And then kids, you always have to have energy with kids because they're their attention spans about two seconds. Um, and then, you know, and then our, at least our, our elite kids, you know, our elite people are at Titan Mercury. Um, we, we pick up the intensity and pace a little bit more there. So it's fun. It's a good time. It sounds Jackie, like a good time. You, uh, let me see. 
Oh, sorry, I was reading Jackie's message. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Brazel. Um, I'm gonna throw it over to Catherine. What is your, um, how does your coaching style and philosophy shift as you go from um, coaching various age levels um, and uh, genders and performance levels? Brazil has already said so many good things already. I mean, I'm just going to like add a, a couple little pieces to it. Cause I mean, everything, I think that, I think it's so good that those are all like uh, becoming baseline, right? The consistency, understanding like the, the athlete itself, the individual understanding some of the dynamics between boys and girls. I also work um, primarily, primarily like one-on-one -on -one with um, boys and girls. And I definitely I don't think that I shift very much, but I can see that the way that they respond to me is, is definitely different. So then I continue to adjust like, oh, they want this or they want more, um, they want more intensity from me. They want me to like push them a little harder um, in terms of mental comfort. So um, so there's that piece, but I, I definitely think that um, when it comes to my coaching philosophy, I actually don't, I don't change it too much across age because um, it's really more like levels of awareness, right? So when we have like our youth kiddos, they have a certain amount of awareness about what they think is fun and exciting. And I like to add, like Brazil was saying, right? I'm going to echo so much of what Brazil was saying. Like, it's got to be fun, but then can I sneak in the really hard things and make them fun? And then do I keep it like very level, uh, age level appropriate? And, and some of my philosophy when it comes to coaching a younger kid, it's like way less technique, way more fun, way more creative um games but then can we do some really hard things that I turn into games so I think it's always coming so then my philosophy doesn't really change as I go up in the level except that now I'm like making the things that are really hard into games it's like almost like you're reversing it and you're like hey I know this is really really hard but can you like gamify it yourself and and challenge yourself to to uh get this takedown even though I know you want to cry right now like let's do it do it again do it like keep you know it's like so the energy stays up and you're challenging them but we're not making it so it's like the hard thing I think Amanda actually said this like wrestling is a really hard sport it just is like we have to do really uncomfortable things all the time but like can we do it with a with a smile even though we're like <laughs> dying inside right can can you like can you bring the excitement and the fun that you had as a kid? And that, that's what I like to do with my high level athletes who are like, oh, this is really hard. I'm like, do it again, do it again. You know, like just where that, you know, at least get to have, uh, we all get to have a little fun with it, even when it gets harder and harder, because it will, it's just inherently going to get harder. Um, so I think, I really think that Brazil hit the nail, you know, on the head with so many, so many things of what she was saying, consistency um, teaching the baseline, but, uh, my to add in is, uh, is levels of awareness the athletes get. And this is also what I do when I work with my athletes, uh, who are just doing mindset, um, sessions with me, we're working. My littles are like, they can hardly handle like a full hour session, but so we can like shorten it. We can just talk about where they are at in terms of like their level of awareness, like just bringing, uh, a, a, con a concept of, of recognizing like when they were uncomfortable and why, and actually like, going through that and connecting it with journaling. Whereas your older athletes are way more connected to their thoughts and their feelings and their why and the outside life that's affecting them. And we can dive into it more and we can bring it, you know, but so then I just keep bringing them to, to the next level of awareness of wherever they're at so that they can bring that awareness into their wrestling. So really, I kind of like to, I kind of have high expectations for every athlete I work with. Um, for them to challenge themselves in that way of, of bringing awareness to their own life and their wrestling. But um, yeah, just level by level. I love hearing you talk about how you're basically teaching the athletes that you work with to be deep thinkers, to be reflective. And, and you do that at all different levels. That sounds, I mean, that's very cool. Um, I'm excited for this whole next generation of wrestlers who's going to be deep thinkers like Catherine Shai. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a follow -up Can I question. add to that really quick? Am yes, I allowed please. to add to that real quick? Yeah. So, so I I started asking a question to my athletes after, like we would debrief, right? Like after a match, right? And I started noticing, like that some of the times, like there's just so much emotion they couldn't even 
get to what was happening in the match. So I'd start with a like, okay, how are you feeling? Like, what, how do you feel after that match? And we, we'd talk through emotions first and then it would be, okay, now think back and let's start analyzing. Do you know what I mean? Analyze your, what was your mindset going into it? Like who would like, do you think it was a strength difference or do you think it was technique difference? What did you have control over? What could you change for next time? And like, you know, once you addressed and validated whatever emotion they're feeling, you know, then there was so much more room for that analysis piece and for them to think back. So yes, the thinkers, and I love that. I love that, Catherine. 100%, 100%. Um, So this kind of brings up, so you guys have heard of the the long-term athlete development model that that USA Wrestling builds out. It's quite lovely. Um, Where did you guys develop that and learn that? Because you speak a lot about, you, you seem to hit that naturally with, um, your reflections, but did you learn that innately or did you learn it from a different, um, part of your education? What is it? Is that the chart? The chart? It's the chart, right? It has all Okay. That chart. Okay. Yeah. That chart. Like the, the, like where, um, it talks about stage. Does it talk about stage before age? Um, yeah, and- like at this age, this should only be competing like this many times or whatever. Yeah. I uh, I didn't ever think about, so I was never like super competitive, like at all ever. So I didn't, I, I think in a year I might've had like six matches to, I don't know. I don't know when I was in high school. Cause I didn't, I only wrestled, I started in high school. Right. But I, I remember when I did see that chart, I was like, why is a sixth grader wrestling over a hundred matches in a year? Why is that even a thing? I didn't, that didn't even click as something that I should pay attention to. But then I saw the chart and I was like, ah, things we should think of for like longevity and retention and maintaining love for the sport for, you know, you know, no burnout as an issue. So yeah, until I saw it, I didn't even, think of, I didn't even realize that was something that should be considered until I saw it. And then it was important. Yeah. Um, Catherine or anybody else, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Like develop athlete development model or just those practices? Yeah. Um, I think it's more like innate and also experience. Um, I started competing pretty young, but it was like very casual. Sorry, it's my pup. Come here. <laughs> um and then it was like I got to high school and girls who had just started that year were like caught up with me and like competitive and so it was kind of like a little bit of a mind trip and you're like wait a minute I should be this I should be that so then now it's just like the experience of having and of of seeing how quickly you can kind of jump the levels as an athlete um and here's my kiddo and uh <laughs> so I think it's a little bit innate um and uh recognizing that that you can, um, you get the, the skill base, the learning to be an athlete, the uh, excitement around that is gonna take your kid really, really far over competing first, like let them be a kid, you know, like this one. I love that. Um, so th- this is a question that like, we kind of run into a lot when it comes to like, or I guess that I see, um, sometimes we see, younger athletes, you know, making it to lots of national tournaments, um, placing high, being very competitive. And then as they go through later in high school, maybe into college, that there's a dip in there, there's a challenge. Um, What is your thoughts on, um, especially for female athletes, uh, um, how do you address that burnout um, for female athletes? Is it about is it about competitive level? Is it about um, mindset? Is it about nutrition? Is it about weight? What, what does that look like? I think it's different for each athlete. Like everyone yeah. has different things that they're sick of or reasons that they're getting burned out. Maybe their parents are overbearing about it. Maybe it is a weight issue. I think it varies person to person, but I actually did write my senior thesis on early sports specialization. And um, I was against early sport specialization back then. And then now as a college coach, I, I still kind of am, um, but it's not so much that I'm like against early sport specialization. I just think 
again, with my like holistic approach, I think like as a co college coach as well, I see, and, and having been a high level athlete, I see that the most well-rounded people um, tend to be like more successful. Um, and I think also as a college coach, one of the things I see is um, I have my different theories as to why, but just um, a lack of athleticism of these girls that are coming in. And I, I do think that if they had had done more sports, maybe that they would have more athletic skills. And I also worry about injury because of it, because wrestling is such a physical and difficult sport. And I just think that if we were developing them more athletically, rather than like trying to teach them how to suplex people when they can't even like <laughs> do a, a, a squat correctly, um, I think that that's really important. And I don't, I, like I said, I have my theories as to why they're not developed so much athletically, but it is an issue that I have seen as at coaching at the college level is just a lack of athleticism among female athletes in general, not just wrestlers. That's really interesting. So you're talking about that like fundamental body awareness, movement, athleticism that translates to all different sports. Mm -hmm. But once if that isn't developed at a young age, your theory is that that's when you're getting burnout or just lack of, uh, you know, competitiveness or injuries. Yes, I just I just think they need to be like more dynamic athletes. And I think that if they were doing different sports or if they were receiving like, um, you know, proper strength and conditioning coaching, like whatever the reason is, like, I think that that would help with a lot of issues, burnout, injuries. Um, whatever it is you know what I mean I, I think just being like more well-balanced athlete <laughs> is better for longevity and and higher success in the sport awesome thank you so much does anybody else have any thoughts on that yeah I think that um also like speaking on burnout like um just having having the awareness within yourself to as to what's burning you out right and having those true and honest conversations within yourself um like if it is a weight issue, right? Like, why is it such a major deal? Like, let's just go up a weight and that is okay. And I think that like us as females, we have this like stigma of that we have to be at a lighter weight and this and that, and it's causing, you know, detrimental, um, you know, burnout, right. In our success and things like that. And so it's like, Hey, you can be, you can go up weight and be just as strong and just as mighty and just as powerful. Right. And, you know, may, maybe if it takes you a little bit longer, it takes you a little bit longer and that's okay. Right. Um, or if it's your parents burning you out, like learning how to, as young women or older women, right. Learning how to use your voice. If you're still competing on like having those conversations with your parents, right. Because I, as a youth and high school coach and club coach and college coach, I, I, I deal with tons of parents across the entire spectrum and they, they almost don't change. And so, um, it's tough because, you know, it's, I also am trying to teach these girls to like, Hey, use your voice. Right. And we're at this, we're in this era of, of empowering young, one young woman to use her voice of like, Hey, mom and dad, or Hey dad, or Hey, you know, so-and-so, um, you know, when we come home, let's separate, you know, these conversations, like let's, let's ask about my grades or let's ask about what's going on in this part of my life or whatever. And not, Hey, what did you weigh today? How much did you run this or that blah, blah, blah. Right. Because I personally myself had to deal with that myself. And I got like, super, super frustrated. And it was like really hard to separate those things. And that would cause my burnout, you know? Um, so just kind of recognizing those things within yourself and what's burning you out, how to have those difficult conversations and how to navigate that and having a positive role model or friend or coach or mentor to help walk you through those things, because sometimes you don't know how to do that um, or how to help self govern and self navigate, you know, when you're burning out and what to do from there. Um, you know, and know that, that taking time is okay as well. I mean, I, I remember like, I felt extremely burned out at one point in my career. It was like my senior year of high school, I had gone on like an eight year streak without like any time off. And I was like, I was just burnt out. And I remember like, it was like a couple months before Fargo nationals. And, um, you know, um, I would took like, took a couple months off and my first tournament back was nationals and I had to like still perform. And there was like that extra pressure of like, Oh, am I still going to do okay? I ended up losing to Sarah Hildebrand in the finals, but it's all right. <laughs> I'm going to blame those like a couple months. <laughs> it was funny. But yeah, just just being able to have self-awareness, you know, um, and navigating through those conversations and what's burning you out and how to work through that is important too. 100%. I really value what you guys 
are speaking about this. It's just really, um, really good wisdom from personal experience, from seeing it, you know, from yourself also seeing it as a coach. And um, I, I see the same thing. So I'm very much appreciative of that. Um, in the chat, people are talking a bit about like Red S and, and like nutrition. And, and I think, I wish we could go into that. Um, I think that if we opened it up, it would be really, <laughs> we wouldn't talk about other things. So um, um, maybe we can talk about that in the future because I think that's a really important piece to burnout and to just uh, the holistic person that is also an athlete. Like how are they going to um, have success throughout the rest of their life? And how are we setting um, athletes up to be successful as, as you know, outside of athletics as well? Um, but I'm going to transition to our last question, and I'd like each of you to share um, one or two of your coaching nuggets of wisdom um, that you would share to your younger coach self or you want to share with all of us. So like, what is like the good stuff that you just want to plop in our plate and we'll fill it up? Who wants I'll, to go first? I'll start. And I'm going to, after I'm done, I'm going to share two resources I have, just ed tech stuff. If anyone wants to use it, copy it, use it, tweak it, whatever you want. Um, but I, uh, my, my husband's uh, active duty military. So I think I've lived in one state, like just two years at a time, right? So I, I haven't been able to like, luckily though, I find a wrestling mat everywhere I go. So that's my home, wherever we go, even here overseas. And that's, this community has saved me in more ways than one. Um, so I've, I've, I've had, I've been lucky enough to been exposed to a lot of different coaching styles, right? And within each coach, there are, there are goods and bads, you know, like things that I want to ask, let's do this. And things I'm like, mm, that might not be for me, may not be like wrong, but maybe not be for me. So I keep this like journal where it's, Sometimes I would, it was a paper journal and, you know, I have a couple with moves, things get lost, right? But it's a list of like this, this is definitely something I want to do. And here's, how I want to tweak it for me from this coach. And like, I'll write down things like, I'll keep a list of things that I want to do moving forward. And then if it's something that's more of a negative, like, ooh, well, I don't like that. That doesn't feel right. I didn't, I didn't see that turn out right. I won't write it down as a negative. I'll write it down as a pot, like how I would change it. You know what I mean? That, so, so I have this ongoing like pool of ideas and, and from, from all these people that I've learned from over the last, what, two decades I've been around the sport. Um, and yet, like, it's, I mean, even old stuff from like 2000, like the early 2000s, I'll go back to and be like, oh yeah, that was a fun game. Yeah. I'm going to bring it back. Or yeah, that, that team night that really helped like pep up the team. You know what I mean? So just keeping like a list and, I, and now it's going to end up being a Google doc, right? Because <laughs> that's it. But having that to go back to, if you need to like find something new to throw in, maybe recycle something, you know, that's old and yeah, that helps. But, I yeah. love that so much. And you said you had two resources that you wanted to share. Um, maybe tell us about them and then could you plop them in the, the um, yeah. chat section? Yeah. So the first one, um, I'll just send it give me a second to copy and paste <laughs> so the first one is uh collecting and organizing athlete information it's basically teaching people how to use google forms to collect information and then organize it because then it'll spit stuff out in a spreadsheet how to organize it and use it for admin purposes so like i used like i saw people bringing like a hundred copies of a 20 page packet for athletes to fill out and i was like can we just send them like a Google form to fill out kind of thing? Cause people are handwriting and we have to like translate. And I don't, when I'm teaching, I don't have kids submit handwritten stuff anymore. Cause I can't read it. Like, so having things typed in just made life easier. Um, so it's, it's the process of setting that up and organizing it. Um, just making life a little easier. Right. But you can use it for so many other things too. Like, during lockdown, it was a COVID check-in screening at the beginning of every practice when we were allowed to come back in. You know, it could be a mental health check-in with your athletes and it just bring a QR code with you. You know, have a QR code up on up on your wall somewhere and kids scan it, they do mental health check-in, you know, before practice, you review it, 
Maybe you check in with a kid who red flagged or something. So there's so many uses for that. Um, and then the second one is just seven ed tech, tool, ed tech tools for wrestling coaches that things that are usually free through whatever school district or university that you're coaching at. So like whatever learning management system your athletes are using in their classes you can utilize that, you know, for wrestling too. And it's just helpful, really fun, helpful tools. Um, I've even seen a lot of uh, professors being willing to, well, this is the like essay assignment or the research project we're doing. Well, can we tweak it and gear it towards, you know, this wrestling topic to help grow our team too? You know what I mean? So maybe doing, I was allowed in a journalism class, I was allowed to do a lot of my papers on my wrestling team. And not only were they posted on the, um, in our, the Northern Michigan um, newspaper, some of them even got posted with USA Wrestling. So it got, I got to start a little bit, you know, in journalism there. So it was, it opened opportunities for that um, using some of those tweaks in there. So yeah. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Laura. No problem. Who wants to go next? Um, I'll go. So I guess like a nugget of wisdom or like advice or something is that um, for like myself and just kind of what I tell other coaches is that remember, remember that you're like developing champions of life through the sport of wrestling. Right. And we tend to like that quote can, that quote can, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? Developing the champions of life through the sport of wrestling. So I feel like a lot of coaches or people or parents tend to entirely put athletes identity into the sport, right? And we just can't do that because at some point the sport will fail you at some point, right? You're going to get injured or you're going to get too old to compete or whatever the case is. And so if you put your entire, entire identity into the sport, um, it's probably not going to end well. And so I'd like to phrase it as like, you know, developing champions of life through the sport of wrestling and um, just creating that wholeness um, for these athletes of, hey, we're going to use this tool, you're going to use this sport, you know, to be successful in all these other areas of your life. And I'm going to show you how and I'm going to guide you, I'm going to constantly show you the bigger picture. Um, and I feel like I try to, you know, tell that to other coaches, because other coaches are so gun ho, which is which is amazing, right? You definitely want to be all in and gun ho for sure. But you don't want to completely submerge somebody's entire identity into the sport. And so I just, I tell coaches to be careful within those things. Um, and so that's where I kind of, um, I read it in a book of, um, you know, developing the champions of life through sport of wrestling. And ever since then, um, I try to incorporate that within my coaching philosophy and things that I preach and talk to other coaches about and my own personal athletes um, all the time. And so um, it's pretty simple, straightforward. I don't have a super long answer for that question, but that's really it. I love that. I think it is very tangible. Um, and I'm going to keep that in my, in my reservoir for sure. Thank you so much, wow. Brazil. Who would like to go next with their nuggets of wisdom? I'll go next. So I don't know, Brazil, I'm gonna wrestle with my grandma. I don't know what you're talking about, too old to compete. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> no, but um, um, I think I think I wanna touch really quick on, I've seen a lot in the comments and in the questions about females who are like, I want to get into coaching. Um, I like, I saw one that was like, I've been wanting to, what did she say? I want, I've been wanting to coach since I was in kindergarten. Oh, so cute. Uh, I've been wanting That's to coach awesome. all girls teams since I was in kindergarten. Wow. The like foresight, you know, like, I don't think I was thinking about coaching anybody else in kindergarten. That's so cool. But, um, I think that this is, and it was talked a little bit, touched on a little bit last night on, on the discussion last night about um, imposter syndrome, about being welcomed back into the room. Like really it's like about welcoming yourself back in the room. And um, until we until we give ourselves the opportunity to, to step up and say, I, I am here. I'm well, you know, the same, it's kind of the same route, right? Right. Like we started saying, I have to just walk in this room, start this wrestling practice, be the only female. Okay. And unfortunately we're like almost in the same, we're in the same thing again in a way. Right. But I think you already like lean on the experience you've had as an athlete. If you want, if you're a female and you want to go into coaching, lean on the experience you already have, because 
it's going to be more than the athletes who are just beginning. And now when it comes to like comparing yourself to the other coaches and all sorts of things, first recognize that as much wisdom as you feel like this coach may or may not have, like you start realizing once you start questioning coaching theories and why do we rest like this? Why do we train like this? You start realizing that like these people don't have all the answers. So don't put everybody so high on a pedestal. Like you have certain, you have skills that you're bringing to the table that somebody else does not have. And whatever you're feeling lack in, that's where you, that's the opportunity for your mastery. So if you're someone, I think the thing that I hear a lot on, um, especially with the coaches that I'm working with, it's the mastery of technique. But I think that that's an endless game. That's always endless. So like start finding and honing your philosophy. So instead of being like, oh, I have to, I have to focus on technique. I need more technique, more technique. Like these athletes don't always need more technique. They need a little bit of like a philosophy, an idea around how they should be performing and training and processing things because they're going to get technique from the clinics they go to, from the other practices they go to, they're going to, they're going to get a lot. And then if you have the desire to increase your skills in the technique side, then work on that mastery. But whatever you have right now is already enough. And it's probably more than you even realize. So I like, I'm really hoping that more females are stepping into those coaching roles because we need them because the girls who are starting wrestling are like, I just want a female in the room with me. And that's going to be that that's going to take women's wrestling to the next level because we'll have the leaders who are actually like bringing the girls into the room. I think that you said so much within those words that you said it just is so much bigger than the amount of words that you said so like yeah so many yeah. words happened <laughs> no not so many words like so much like I think you've just hit the nail on the head that it really speaks to so many pieces that I think um female coaches experience that imposter syndrome a little bit of like comparing yourself to others and and like how to address that so I just I'm Yes, I'm going to go back and also listen to that again once we get this, because it's good stuff. Thank you so much. And Amanda, you get to take us home. <laughs> okay, no pressure. <laughs> um, I think what I'm going to say is probably going to overlap with some of what other people have said, but um, I think along the lines of what Brazil said about like our identity, our identities being tied to winning um, a lot of times, whether it's an athlete or a coach, I think that that is something to be avoided. Um, I think a lot of times we need to remember like why we're actually doing this. Um, and it's something I learned a lot at the senior level too, is, um, you know, only, only one person at each weight wins the Olympic gold medal each year. And that doesn't mean that, um, everyone else's journey was worthless. Like it's, it's for so much more than medals that we do this. Um, it's the relationships, it's the lessons we learn, it's everything else. So, um, I think from a coach perspective to remember that when you're, when you're coaching your athletes, just remember that it's about the journey for them as well as you. Um, so also not to place too much of your identity as a coach into how your athletes are performing and just being um, a resource and a mentor for them and being the person that you wish that you had um, when you were younger, like I said earlier. And also um, to the effect of like imposter syndrome, whether it's as an athlete or a coach, um, I think that we're all so unique and be because of our unique experiences and our unique resources or, or geography or even um, ethnicity that comes into play or us being females, any of those things that like make us unique um, are our gifts to our athletes. So I think whatever, whatever you're coming from and like whatever you're bringing to the table, like you're offering something unique for your athletes. Um, so own that and don't feel like you ever have to be anyone else or be something that you're not because what you're offering is its own unique gift to your athletes. Uh, it really speaks to me a hundred percent. You, uh, as a coach, you have so much impact in the people that, um, you, you get to coach. And I feel very happy for all your guys as coach, your, all your athletes, because, um, I have learned so much today from each of you. Um, and, and 
just uh, I'm really proud of our our wrestling world to have you guys in it. Um, we're going to go and get some questions from the audience, people uh, questions that people have popped in. Um, we have about four questions as of now. Um, and so we'll run over a little bit of time, I think maybe 10 minutes or so, maybe 15. Um, so that's how you guys can plan. I know you guys are tired, but this is such good stuff. We just want more of it anyhow. Um, from Elena, she says, I'm a college, uh, I'm a collegiate wrestler and I want to coach high school again while, um, while in my senior year. What's the best way to accomplish this and do both? She wants to coach uh, high school, I think, as, as also being an athlete. How do you do both of those things? Amanda, that's a question for you, being a coach and an athlete at the same time. I'm reading it, I'm like, <laughs> um, okay, so it's like I said about balance, and I think something important to go into something like that is understanding your priorities, regardless of what they are. Um, that's unique to you and, and there's no right or wrong there. Like if you're doing multiple things, like there's going to have to be kind of like a ranking and it might change week to week or month to month. Um, but knowing like your timeline, kind of like how you're periodizing your priorities and then, um, making sure that your time and your energy, like I said, is aligned with your priorities. So kind of doing like a check-in, whether it's weekly or monthly. Um, and like, I know for me, um, like I said, as, as a coach athlete coaching, regardless of anything tends to like expand and like take over things. So for me, I have to make sure that I am scheduling like my personal athlete or my training times first, because anything else is going to get filled up by coaching. Um, so I, like I said, I use Google calendar a ton. Um, I use that for my personal, I have like a couple different calendars. So it's kind of cool because you can toggle your calendars in there. Um, but I, and you can like overlay your different calendars. So I have like my personal calendar, but then I also have my uh, calendar for my athletes and for our team where all of our training times and everything are put in there. So the athletes can see that, but it's also helpful for me to schedule my stuff. Um, and it's just a resource I use, like I said, to make sure that my time is aligned with like my goals and my priorities. Especially as a senior in college, right? I mean, that's a big deal, right? You're ending your college career and you want to make sure that you do right by yourself and all the hard work that you've put in and, and prioritize yourself during that. Even though you want to coach, you got to know that like wrestling is going to be around for a long time, you know, um, and it's never going away. So um, don't, don't put yourself last just because you're really, really eager to coach. Definitely coach. It's You learn a lot from coaching yourself. You know, it's going to make you a better wrestler on, on yourself as well. And so, I, you know, we definitely say go for it and get plugged in. Um, but definitely don't shortchange yourself your senior year of college. Can I, can I, I add to that actually real quick? So, like, we were just talking, I think, like, what, 10, 5, 10 minutes ago about athlete burnout. But we also don't want to have coach burnout either you know what I'm saying um so I think it's fair like I've learned we just we just had our son in, in August right and I've I've had to start who was talking about boundaries earlier I think someone was talking about boundaries I, at the very beginning yes and so like I am used to saying yes 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 to everything involving wrestling right and like because there's a there's a there's a U.S. Air Force base that has a wrestling team about an hour and a half north and I initially said yes 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 but that would involve me driving an hour and a half after work up to the base and then two hours of practice and an hour and a half back down. You know what I mean? And that I don't want to be away from my family that long during the week, you know? And so like I, I had to, so we're brainstorming other ways of doing it. So like maybe, maybe you look at like, okay, maybe, you know, we have, we have a month off from competition. And so maybe I can come like once a week you know, dip my feet into it. But I, I think, again, like they said, making sure that you're balancing that, you know, com co uh, competition life with coaching life, making sure neither end is getting burned out um, is really important. So, but there's a way to make it work. Maybe like one, one day a week or one clinic here and there, that's might help. Uh, I think that's really great, great feedback. And I, as I heard that, 
did we did we speak to coach athlete life balance? Did we cover that question or did I skip it as I went from one page to another? Cause I, that was a big question. Did we skip it? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I, feel like we did, I feel like we did touch on it. Yeah. Yeah. We, t- we touched on yeah, it. Talked about it. I think maybe yeah. all individually in the beginning a little bit, mm-hmm. kind of. Can I hear from some mothers? Um, <laughs> Laura, you just shared a bit, but I think this is a big one for, I mean, I happen to be a mother. I've got kids all around. You just don't see them. I was throwing things at them. (laughs) Um, How do you balance being a parent and being a coach and having a job and being, you know, in relationships? How do you balance all those different pieces? Catherine. Oh, you're throwing it back. A superhuman like Catherine Shy. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna use Jackie Davis's mother-in-law's quote because it's my favorite right now. You can have it all, just not at the same time. Like that's been so <laughs> impactful for me too. Um, really, you can have it all, just not at the same time. Like I had to really compartmentalize things, especially when I decided to come back and compete. I was like, oh, I started this whole thing, and I really want Lutrafit to grow, and I want to do more, 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 and more. And I'm now starting to work with athletes. How do I balance all that? So it, it just, I would just have to like, just have create boundaries. I'd have to say no, lots of no's. And right now, because now I'm a mother of two, um, I've really structured things tightly. So I'm like, I'm only available at this time here and that's it. And then, you know, I'm available for this kind of clinic event. Like I'm really, um, I'm really trying to create like what I want. So I'm like, I want to do a clinic. It should look like this. Um, I can make myself available for this time or whatever. And then like kind of help that usher that into existence or like look for somebody who's uh, looking for a clinic, right? Um, so I keep making myself available for what I know I can handle instead of waiting for the opportunities that show up and then be like, should I take it? Should I not? Oh no, the next thing could be coming. Oh, like, like FOMO starts showing up. So I've just like made my boundaries super clear. Um, and when I was competing, that was definitely, it was definitely really hard, uh, to do. I basically dropped Lucha Fit the whole time I was competing. And then I dropped it the whole time I was pregnant last year. And now I'm like, I'm ready. I'm like rated. So, so I think the other advice is it's okay to drop something off completely because it will always be there, right? Like, just like Brazil said, it'll always be there. It's always going to be available to pick back up. And um, for me, family, just like that's priority. So that'll show up first. And then then as I can kind of create it the way I want, then it becomes fun instead of like a burden and, and time away from family. That gets really hard. 100%. I think that's really good advice. I love the quote that you can do all the things, just not all at the same time. Yeah, I wrote that. Shout out to Jackie's mother-in-law. <laughs> Yay, Jackie's mother-in-law. Seriously, I was like, is the right thing I needed to hear early postpartum, you know? So I'll let her know that it extended to a larger group. <laughs> 100%. You should create one of those like quote, like pictures or whatever, and, and not the name, but Jackie's mother in law. <laughs> like, mother in law. I like that. Yeah. Like the next uh, D1 Women's Wrestling or Lucha Fit t shirt, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll Laura, order that right now. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, do you want to speak on that uh, more as a juggling family? And I mean, you're you're relatively new at this, right? You've just been doing it for like six, seven, eight, nine months. Yeah, right. Um, it's an adventure. Uh, so I will I will say like so my partner, my my husband, he's he's very his thing is track cycling, right? And my thing is wrestling, and we've. Um, like sometimes we'll tag along, like I'll go to his competitions and, and watch him compete and he has showed up, but like when he goes, when I'm refing or coaching, he's just watching me point and throw, you know, and yell in the corner. So it's not really like a thing, but what we've done, cause we, we knew coming into parenthood, like we didn't want to lose our identities as Laura and wrestler and Bryant as cyclist, you know what I mean? I mean, we love our son, obviously, but we didn't want to lose who we were. Um, so one day when he goes off to college and leaves the nest, we were still us, you know what I mean? And we were still a couple together. So we 
like I said earlier, like I've, I've had to balance what I say yes to um, and, and also who I say yes to spending time with energy wise um, to make sure I have enough of my cup filled up so that I can fill my son's cup up. You know what I mean? Um, and we've, we've made it an effort to, like we just went to a tournament in Spain and we, we went to Spain a couple of days early and did sightseeing stuff together as a family. And right, we made sure he brought his bike. So he got to like ride his bike around Spain. We're like trying to go to veteran world championships in Greece. So he'll get to like ride his bike around Greece. But then when, when I'm roughing all day, um, he gets to just like chill at a hotel pool with Joey and he's a happy camper, you know what I mean? So we try to turn these, these events into family things that we can do together. So there has only been two wrestling events since we've lived in England that Bryant hasn't been to because we, we try to make them family events supportive together, you know what I mean? And it's, it's communicating, like we work together on that, on that need. And we're not sure yet if it will be the same whenever we get stationed back in the US. Um, but for, for here right now, it's, that, is, that system is working for us. I love that. I, I like, I've been, my oldest is 16 years old and I'm currently learning things from you guys right now about how to manage that. So I think it's something that we continue to develop and, and, and practice. Um, I'd love to hear from Brazil. You talked a little bit about boundaries and we said that we we're going to return to it. So let's return to it. Can you tell us more about how um, you really create those boundaries for yourself after being a yes person? And yeah. uh, and a hustler for learning. How do you? How have you? How have you developed those boundaries? Um, so you so you still stay happy, healthy, and in the sport. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I'm yeah, just talking to some two good friends of mine. Um, one is on here, Emma, and also Marcy uh, Van Dusen, who's um, I met Marcy when I was about 13 years old, and we've just kind of. Uh, she was like a mentor to me. And then we kind of just, she was my college coach for a little bit and she kind of just took me under her wing. And, um, but there's times where just in casual conversations, when we're talking and just kind of, especially as I've grown up into, you know, a younger woman, um, our, our dynamic of conversations change into obviously more adult like conversations, which has been cool because, you know, starting at 13 years old, our, our relationship was different, right. When I was at the Olympic training center and I met her there. And then as I, we, as we grow together and now as we're like colleagues and friends and stuff and, and mentors and the same thing with, with Emma, um, who I spent a lot of time talking with and stuff, it's, we have that um that like friendship right but also like a mentorship too that I like view her as as well and so it's like our it's cool that our conversations can go from one dynamic of you know work related issues or things that we're struggling with as women or as coaches or as leaders or whatever the case is and then it can change into like oh my gosh I can't wait till this happens in our life or whatever or motherhood or this or that you know um but I mean, there's just comments that are made of when, you know, these friends and mentors of mine that are just constantly say, hey, you know, you've got to learn how to want to say no, or hey, don't worry, this is always going to be there, or hey, you've got to take care of yourself first, or, you know, and just constantly um, reiterating that to me. And so finally, I was like, you know what, like, I don't have to be at everything, I, you know, I've like, I, and I, I have to feel that within myself, you know, there's times where I feel tired or exhausted. And I spread myself too thin, you know, and so what I did um, this past year was, um, I got really, really, really um, OCD about my calendar. Right? We talked about calendars and planners and um, and I made sure everything was blocked off accordingly. And I made sure that I blocked off certain weekends or certain times for myself and things like that. Um, and setting setting those, um, you know, those boundaries ahead of time, like months in advance. That way, when somebody says, hey, can you go do this clinic for me in two months? And, you know, and I'm, I'll look at my calendar and it's blocked off already for my own personal time or family time or whatever, I can automatically say, no, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm booked that weekend or I can't, or I've got, you know, I've, I, you know, I already have that time set apart for myself or whatever, instead of being like, oh yeah, I have a free weekend. No problem. Next thing you know, I had every single weekend booked. And that used to happen to me all the time where, you know, I wasn't home for, you know, I'd say like, there was like a period of time where like, I wasn't home for a weekend and for like four months. And so that was a lot of time, you know? And so now this past, this past year, what I did was just started immediately blocking off chunks throughout each month, um, just blocking off chunks, just chunks, whether it was like two weekends a month, one week in a month, you know, maybe one week a month, whatever the case is. Um, 
you know, I'm here in Mexico right now and I blocked this off. Um, like, you know, I'd say like four or five months ago, just to make sure like I wasn't going to do anything. Right. Emma was like, Hey, come do this college combine for me. you know, um, the day you get back from Mexico. And I was like, Oh, I would love to, but no. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so like, just like little things like that. I'm like, I'll be at the next one though. And I'll block it off and I'll put it in my calendar, you know? So um, just things like that, just kind of, you know, like we talked about the cup analogy this whole time of just making sure that my cup is filled so that way I can continue filling in if that means I have to say no. And that's OK, too, because I know that I've got good people around me that are always going to const- constantly reach out or I'm going to reach out. And we're always going to collaborate together. I think us, this whole group on here, I feel like a lot of us have been friends for a long time. Um and we're always going to rely on each other and continue, just continue to like collaborate. Right. I'm such a people person myself as my own personality um, that I love, love, love collaborating with, with fellow like-minded women and people. And so I just have to know that like, no matter what, I'm going to say no right now, but guess what? I know that we'll collaborate in the future. And so, and I'm, and I, that sits well with my soul. Oh, I love how you state that. Well, we have reached the end of our time, even though there's some really great questions that I wish we could get to. Um, it is almost 2 a.m. in England, and uh, we got to let Laura go to bed. Um, so I would like to say thank you to all of our panelists and to the volunteers that have put up put the series together and to everyone who joined tonight. Your, uh, your commitment to women's wrestling makes a difference to the people you support directly and to the development of women's wrestling across our nation. Tomorrow will be our final session. We'll talk about careers in wrestling beyond coaches. We have an incredible set of panelists and your Zoom link will from tonight will work and I'll also be sending that out again. Thank you all and have a good night.